So what about optimistic rollups? So optimistic rollups uh, use something called fault proofs. The reason they are called optimistic is that when a uh, when uh, a new state root is added to uh, an optimistic rollup, uh, the bridge contract corresponding to an optimistic rollup, we are not sure if it is correct or not. So we optimistically think it is correct and we move forward. But at a later stage, it can be proved faulty. It can, somebody can give something called a fault proof to prove that a state state root was incorrect. Then that state root state root will be rejected. So each state root is accompanied by an ETH deposit. So this is called the bond or the uh, deposit or the uh, the stake. You can see some people call it a stake. For example, if I in Arbitrum, the deposit uh, when I submit a, if I want to submit a new state root to Arbitrum, then I have to accompany it with a phi ether deposit, and phi ether now corresponds to around six thousand dollars. If the state root is proved to be faulty, then the submitter of the state root will lose their deposit, and uh, like uh, like in the previous lecture we saw half of the deposit is burnt and the other half is given to the fault prover so and the reason for burning it is that again uh, the the submitter sub, somebody who submitted a faulty proof should not be proving their own fault and getting back their whole deposit so you want to burn half of it and once the state root is proved faulty its successors are also marked as invalid it is rejected uh, and like I said, if the half the deposit is not burnt, then some people may want to delay the uh, L2 chain progress at no cost. Because when there is a uh, fault proof uh, mechanism being, uh, the fault is being proved, there is some delay. Everybody is watching the chain to see what is the result of the fault proof. So some chain progress may be uh, delayed because of a fault proof. So that is why we burn half the deposit to prevent malicious parties by just submitting faulty state routes and then proving the fault themselves. So the mechanism for proving faults is different in application specific and general purpose optimistic rollup. AS is for application specific and GP is general purpose. So application specific optimistic rollups, the state root can only be faulty in a finite number of ways. So they can be exhaustively enumerated. So there is a, a you can prove that a state root is faulty using a small number of layer one transactions. Uh, for example, fuel V1 is a payments only optimistic rollup. It only supports payments. So, in, if you have only payments, then the only kind of faults can be double spending or spending coin, more coins than you have, and uh, and uh, like a finite set of state changes which are allowed anyway in an application specific rollup. So, the faults are also finite. So, like uh, double spending, invalid input, malformed block, and so on. So, if uh, two L1 transactions are enough to prove faults. So, you can have a first transaction which posts a hash of the fault proof to prevent front running. Front running is Suppose I have I submit a fault proof, then I'm going to get like 2.5 ETH, which is half of this deposit because my fault proof was correct. Then somebody may pay higher fees and some resubmit the same fault proof and take that 2.5. So front running is you try to uh, go ahead of a transaction which is in the process of being included in a block. So the second L1 transaction posts the actual fault proof, uh, and uh, so, in application specific optimistic rollups, a small number of transactions are enough to prove faults. But in general purpose optimistic rollups, we need to we play an interactive game between the prover and the verifier, or in this case, the challenger and the uh, prover. So, uh, let us look at the uh, mechanism this interactive game in optimistic rollups. So, general purpose rollups support arbitrary contracts. So, if you are an optimistic rollup, if it is general purpose, it will have arbitrary contract arbitrary contracts on it. So, you can install contracts on it. The challenge is that it is infeasible to enumerate all possible ways in which a fault can be present in a uh, in a general purpose optimistic rollup. That is all possible ways in which a state root can be faulty. So, setup is you have an asserter. So, there will be a party which will post a new state root to the bridge contract and then there is a challenger. The challenger will say that no, the state root you posted is incorrect and they were going to play an interactive game. But they both agree on the previous state root. So, other, if they do not agree on the previous state root, then the challenger will challenge that previous state root. So, the setup is that there is a previous state root R previous, which everybody agrees is fine. But uh, the asserter says that the new state root is R new, but the challenger says no, it is not correct. The challenger will claim that there is a new state root R C H new, which is the which should be the next root after a particular layer 2 block is executed. 
but both agree on the layer 2 block of transactions because this is uh, the layer 2 block of transactions is posted as call data on the ethereum main chain so they both know that the block for which uh, which after uh, uh, the block which is executed after our previous state root is a particular set of uh, transactions sequence of transactions so the asserter's claim is from our previous if you execute some block of transactions you get our new as a new state root but the challenger is saying no that's not true from our previous if you execute uh, the same block of transactions you're going to get our new superscript ch or let's call it rch new so this is the setup so the asserter and the challenger have different views of the uh, layer 2 blockchain asserter is claiming that our new is a new state root but the challenger is saying no it's not the new state root there is some other state root which is rch new but the block of transactions they both agree on that and this is uh, fixed because this will be posted as call data l2 blocks are posted as call data so this will be fixed and it consists of a sequence of opcodes op1 op2 these are all opcodes some n opcodes let's say so the fault proof strategy is that you identify the first layer 2 opcode where the fault occurs and you prove that fault on chain and the main insight is that the number of opcodes is limited so the number of opcodes may be 256 that's a small number of opcodes so they can be exhaustively enumerated and uh, you will say that okay i know the first opcode at which our state routes diverged let's identify that first and then for the inputs are known because the inputs are the layer 2 transactions so the inputs to the opcode are known then uh, for a same inputs and same opcode the challenger and the asserter will differ in what the new output is and once you identify that that uh, uh, opcode is actually executed in the bridge contract and the bridge contract can verify whose claim is correct is it the challenger or the asserter so to find the first opcode the challenger and the asserter are going to are going to play something called a bisection game uh, let's look at what that bisection game is it's an interactive game for proving faults so the uh, interactive game has two stages one is an nary search it's not bisection it's n nary search so if it was binary search it would be a bisection but it can be an nary search so what you're going to do is you're going to divide this opcodes op1 to op1 n and they're going to search uh, do an nary search to identify the first opcode where the challenger and the asserter disagree and then once you identify the first opcode then you will just do a one step proof the bridge contract will execute that one particular opcode and you'll figure out who is correct and who is wrong so in the nary search stage the challenger first publishes intermediate state routes between our previous and our new our new ch uh, so let me show a picture here so you have this uh, op1 to op n is the set of all opcodes in that layer 2 block these are all l2 opcodes uh, r previous was the previous state route on which both the challenger and the asserter they have agreed on and then uh, the challenger says uh, it's rch new is the new route and uh, asserter says it's r new so there must be some state route in between where they disagree if there was no state route where they disagreed then it can't be that these two are different so either they disagreed in the last state route or they disagree in one some previous state route so both the challenger and the receiver are trying to find out where the disagreement first occurs and the root locations are chosen such that the amount of computation is almost equal in all these uh, batches so there is some place where there is a first state route there is at least one state route where they disagree and there will always be a first so let uh, the asserter will choose the first route where they it disagrees from the challenger and it will publish n minus 1 state routes between that and the previous one so let's say ri is the first state route where they disagree then it'll choose the previous one ri minus 1 and it'll publish uh, uh, n minus 1 state routes be between that so let's uh, um, suppose r2 is the first state route where they disagree i'll have a picture here uh, so this is the first stage you had uh, r previous to r new or rch new it was divided into n blocks or n partitions then suppose r2 is the first location first state route where the challenger and the asserter disagree now that uh, uh, portion of opcodes that is divided further into n parts so this is r1 i have put here r2 i have put here and now the asserter will publish so the challenger did the first set of publishing so the challenger published these intermediate state routes now the asserter will publish the intermediate uh, state routes between r1 and r2 where in this example r2 is the first state route where they disagree and this process keeps going this nary search keeps going 
until they identify the first opcode where they both differ. And it alternates between the challenger and the asserter because this uh, publishing of state routes this is happening on layer 1. So, whoever publishes they have to actually pay the layer 1 fees. So, that is expensive. So, if you only had one party to do that then that would not uh, be fair. So, you have this alternating between the challenger and the asserter. At the end a single layer 2 opcode is identified and uh, both parties will agree on the input to this opcode, but they disagree on the output. So, this one step proof is now re-executed in a L1 contract. So, the the number of layer 2 opcode is limited, there may be 256 possible opcodes like add is an opcode, multiply is an opcode. So, once they identify which opcode it is, they already have identified the inputs to that opcode, then they will just run that opcode in the layer 1 contract and identify the winner. And the losing party's deposit is confiscated. So, when a, a challenger challenges a, a, the state route, it also has to put in a deposit, otherwise there is no, it has nothing to lose. So, it will also put in a deposit and whoever is a losing party their deposit is confiscated and the winner is rewarded. So, the interactive game in, in pictorial form what I just described uh, it goes like this. So, the first the, uh, the asserter publishes a state route and then it publishes uh, state route R new, R previous was the previous state route nobody disputes that then it publishes a new state route R new. Then the challenger says no there is something wrong with your new state route I am going to publish n minus 1 uh, intermediate state routes between r previous and r new and then uh, the asserter now publishes uh, finds the first state route where they both uh, disagree and then it will publish intermediate state routes between that then this keeps going intermediate state routes again and then finally, there is a one step proof. Once the location of the first opcode or the first opcode where they differ is identified then they will just send a one step proof. And this fault pro proof protocol it involves multiple L1 transactions and that can be censored by malicious miners. So, the because of uh, to avoid censorship each the asserter and the challenger are given one week of time in a chess style clock. So, chess style in the sense when one player is playing their time is running and when they stop that when it is other players turn this players uh, clock stops. So, they have about uh, uh, the entire fault pro proof protocol can take up to two weeks. This two weeks time is because there can be censorship or maybe there is congestion in the network. Sometimes uh, when there is some uh, uh, there is a high demand maybe there is some particular application on ethereum which is become very popular and everybody is trying to make some money by using that application maybe it is some kind of uh, NFT drop you have to claim that by sending a transaction. Then uh, there may be a lot of activity on ethereum network. Then the fees on ethereum can go up uh, can become high. and uh, then uh, if the fees are high it may not be feasible no pun intended no it may not be feasible to send these intermediate state routes here. So, because of this they have this they just came up with this uh, just a arbitrary <coughs> amount of time it is one week of time for each uh, player uh, each party and it is a two whole of two weeks for the fault protocol to go through. Okay. And if nobody challenges a state route for one week it is considered uh, finalized. So, that is the mechanism. So, any questions about this? So, the question was that is the challenger a smart contract on ethereum? Uh, it will be a just a externally owned account just some public key, uh, but uh, uh, most of the roller projects will have to give you software for doing this uh, for uh, to initiate the actions of a challenger easily. Uh, so, this generating of this intermediate state routes if I am a non technical user that is not easy. So, how do I know what are the intermediate state I need some software to run that. So, hopefully this will be automated that uh, I just need to have enough uh, ether to pay the deposit to challenge and then the process of uh, generating these intermediate state routes will be just running some command and then sending the intermediate state. Route. So, sir that software is provided by uh, that, uh, that so the software for uh, generating these intermediate state routes would have to be provided by the roll up operator themselves. Okay. Uh, so, what is the roll up user experience like? So, the roll up user experience the first step is always before you can transact on layer 2 you need to have some ether on layer 2 otherwise you cannot pay the fees layer 2 also is a separate blockchain it has fees because if there is no fees again there will be spam. So, your layer 1 ether has to be first deposited into layer 2. So, the first step is always depositing layer 1 tokens to layer 2. So, you deposit tokens to the bridge contract. So, that is what I showed you earlier there was some 45,000 ether in the optimisms bridge contract. 
you deposit tokens and then once you deposit then uh, uh, the roll up operator will read deposit transactions it will create an L2 block which includes and it will mint your it will mint the equivalent amount of uh, tokens on layer 2. Then that uh, block the state root of that block will be sent to the bridge contract and then that uh, once that state root is verified it will be uh, the user uh, balance will be updated. So, typically it takes about an hour. So, I in the previous uh, deposit we did uh, that took about 20 minutes to uh, go from layer 1 to layer 2. So, uh, do you need to wait 7 days for your deposit to go through? So, the 7 day waiting period in optimistic rollups does not apply to layer 1 deposits. So, we need a fault proof only when uh, we do not know, uh, we do not have access to the transaction. So, layer 2 transactions, the layer 1 contract does, does has no visibility into lay, what is happening on layer 2, it only sees a state route. So, that is why you need that 7 day waiting period to challenge the state route. But the bridge contract, the layer 1, uh, layer 1 can see the deposit. So, deposit is happening on layer 1. So, it can read the deposit, it knows everything about the deposit. So, those transactions, there is no fault which can happen because of those transactions. So, those are, uh, they do not have a, a 7 day waiting period. And uh, so, that is uh, uh, like one step one of the roll up user experience. The reason I say roll up user experience is I want to uh, bring your attention to the parts where the user experience is going to be degraded. There is going to be some latency, some extra onboarding steps. So, here is an extra onboarding step. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so the question was if the fault detection process takes 7 days, why does it, uh, uh, why does a deposit come in 1 hour? So, again to repeat what I said before, the fault detection process, uh, so uh, the fault detection is, uh, fault proof is required because a layer 1 contract, the bridge contract does not know what is happening on layer 2 because it is just a smart contract. Layer 2 has its own blockchain, some transactions are happening. Uh, but the layer 1 contract can see the deposit happening because this is this uh, deposit of tokens is a layer 1 transaction. So, there is no nothing faulty which can happen because it can read all the details of the deposit. So, sir, uh, that uh, process is not involved in uh, detecting the fault uh, Yeah, so the uh, it is not required because uh, it uh, 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 there is uh, no way that the state root can be faulty for deposit transactions because deposit transactions can be read by the layer 1 contract. So, it knows all the details of it. So, layer 2 is uh, like you can say it is opaque to the layer 1 contract. The bridge, bridge contract cannot see what is happening in layer 2. So, layer 2 transactions could be uh, faulty, but uh, deposit is a layer 1 transaction. It is happening on main Ethereum. So, that is why it is not required. Okay. Uh, so, lay, uh, here is a second step in the rollup user experience is applies only to this validity rollups also called ZK rollups. So, there is setting up of this layer 2 public key. This is again an extra onboarding step if you want to use validity rollups. So, the validity rollups use zero knowledge proofs to prove correctness of the state routes and uh, for efficiency reasons if the, uh, the layer 2 public key is uh, from a pairing friendly curve then it becomes cheaper. Uh, so, this is uh, this kind of extra onboarding step is required in ZK Sync 1.0 and Polygon Hermes 1.0. It is not needed in the ZK EVMs which are the general purpose validity rollups. So, the what is the uh, setting up involved in? So, you will the layer 2 user wallet will send a set public key transaction uh, and this costs layer 2 fees not layer 1 fees which is much much lower. And then once the block is confirmed, uh, then the public key change is confirmed. So, block is confirmed means you create an L2 block, you send that L2 block and state root to the bridge contract, you generate a validity proof and then you send the transition proof. The proof is verified on the bridge contract. This proof verifies that a transition, by transition I mean root transition from R current, uh, from R previous to R current or from R current to R new. And then once it is verified, then the public key is set. But this is an extra onboarding step in uh, ZK 1.0 and Polygon Hermes 1.0. So, the layer 2 once that uh, is state is finalized then the layer 2 wallet will get a confirmation. So, this is one part an extra onboarding step in validity rollups. So, what is the most of the users will be doing this step 3 which is transacting on layer 2. Uh, so, layer 2 transacting uh, it just involves so from your layer 2 wallet you will send a transfer transaction. Uh, use and these uh, 
So, in a regular Ethereum, transactions are sent to the peer to peer network. They are not sent to a particular entity, they are sent to the peer to peer network and transaction is broadcast everywhere. Here, the transaction has to be, has to be sent to the, the operator's RPC endpoint. There is a single uh, point of uh, control here, you can say. It is sent to the operator's RPC endpoint, and that RPC endpoint, so, uh, so again, there is no P2P network on layer 2. Then the rollup operator will create the blocks. They will uh, post the call data, uh, layer 2 blocks as call data, send the layer 2 state routes, it will get verified and then the user balance will be updated. So, this is uh, how the transaction process on layer 2 works. So, layer 2's uh, users will experience a latency between transaction submission and finalization. So, the that is the trade off. So, the trade off is that there is a uh, uh, so, this process, if I send a transfer transaction on layer 1, it takes about 13 seconds uh, to get included in a block. But on layer 2, all these processes need to happen, only then the balance will get updated. So, the, this is the fundamental trade off of rollups. So, you are going to get cheaper fees, but it will take longer for your transaction to get confirmed. So, that is the main role, main trade off. And uh, validity and optimistic rollups, they have different uh, L2 transaction finalization trust models and latency. So, how long does it take to finalize a layer 2 transaction? So, the that is di it is different for different uh, rollup technologies, validity rollups and optimistic rollups. So, validity rollups, the layer 2 transactions are finalized once the proofs are verified on chain. So, how long does it take to uh, verify a proof on chain? Uh, to Anything you do on chain, by on chain I mean on mainnet, Ethereum mainnet, on layer 1, anything you do there it costs money. So, to amortize the on chain verification fees, uh, several layer 2 state routes will be bunched together and they will be verified together. So, for zk sync 1.0, the latency is about 1 hour. Uh, for StarkX, the latency is about 7 to 10 hours. So, every 7 to 10 hours they do a verification on Ethereum main chain. So, latency can be as long as 10 hours. For Polygon Hermes is 1.0, the latency is about 6 hours. So, this is for validity rollups, but once verified, then there is no fault because the zero knowledge proof proves that the state transition is correct. So, there will not be any fault proof after that. So, once it is verified, then it is finalized. But optimistic rollups, there is a trade off, there is a spectrum of trust models and uh, finalization latencies. So, a one of end trust model, suppose there is at least one honest party that can submit a fault proof. Then the L2 transactions are finalized if no challenges are done in the 7 day uh, period where the challenge period is open. Uh, and the latency is about 7 days. So, if I do a transaction, I can only be confident that the transaction is correct only after 7 days. That is a very long uh, time period. But most users use this one of one trust model. So, they trust like uh, the, either the user trans, trusts the rollup operator or they trust a party that reads the sequence of L2 blocks and uh, calculates the L2 state. So, an example of such a, a, a party can be like a layer 2 wallet. Suppose there is a layer 2 wallet you trust, then that layer 2 wallet will read all the sequence of L2 blocks which are submitted to the bridge contract because they are submitted as call data to the layer 1 bridge contract and they can recalculate the layer 2 state. So, the sequence of layer 2 blocks is frozen once the uh, transactions in the call data transactions are have enough confirmations. So, if the trusted party or layer 2 wallet confirms that the state routes are correct, the user will ac accept them as final. So, the an example of this is like an L2 wallet provider. So, in this case the latency is a few minutes, the few minutes is the L1 confirmation time. By L1 confirmation I, time I, what I mean is suppose a sequence of L2 blocks was included in uh, an Ethereum block on layer 1. Uh, each new block takes about 13 seconds. So, if uh, in a few minutes you will have some few tens of blocks in which is built upon that call data block and once it is confirmed, you can be confirmed, you can be sure of the sequence of layer 2 transactions and then you can be confident that the layer 2 root is correct. So, here, uh, so if you have one off end trust model in optimistic rollups, you have to wait 7 days to be sure that your transaction was correct. Or, or went through correctly, but if you have one of one, one trust model which most layer 2 users have this one of one trust model, they trust some layer 2 wallet provider, then in a few minutes your transaction will get uh, confirmed. So, instead of 13 seconds, if you are willing to wait for a few minutes, then you will pay much much less fees on layer 2. 
there is also something called a sequencer mode which is uh, only the sequencer is allowed to add a layer 2 blocks and user trusts the sequencer. So, here it is user trusts the sequencer or some other party, but if the user trusts the sequencer completely then uh, the latency is only a few seconds even before the uh, call data is posted on layer 1 the sequencer can send you a, uh, a layer 2 state route and if you trust the sequencer then you will just say that okay my, my transaction has been included in a particular state uh, whose state route is available to me. So, in this case the latency is only a few seconds. So, sometimes users may suppose I feel that optimism is a, a reliable company then I may be fine as long as uh, optimism once I submit my layer 2 transaction if optimism responds and says that I have received your transaction the optimism RPC gateway says I have received your transaction then you can go ahead with whatever uh, real world actions like real world action can be that maybe I am uh, I am uh, selling something for layer 2 ether uh, as soon as I see that layer 2 ether has been transferred by the buyer then I will part with my goods or services. So, the then what is the roll up experience for withdrawal? So, deposits I said you from layer 1 it goes to layer 2, but withdrawal is from layer 2 to layer 1. So, in validity roll ups again it is you will layer 2 wallet will send a withdrawal transaction that will be included in a block I, have, I have put this in grey because this process is the same as before. So, as soon as uh, the proof is verified on chain the latency can be sometimes 7 hours, 10 hours can be 6 hours or can be 1 hour. Then once the, uh, the state route is verified on chain you send a withdrawal transaction and the tokens are transferred to you. So, from layer 2 if you want to withdraw to layer 1 it is expensive. So, you do not want to do it often typically you do transfer your assets to layer 2 stay on layer 2 for as much as possible and then do withdrawals only at a later stage so, because the withdrawal transaction will cost layer 1 fees and withdrawals from layer 2 to layer 1. So, this was for validity roll ups like ZK roll ups for in optimistic roll ups there are two scenarios there is something called a liquidity provider or an LP liquidity providers can speed up your withdrawal, but uh, uh, without liquidity providers we look at first suppose there is no liquidity provider. Then the user sends a layer to withdrawal transaction, uh, the blocks are created, state routes are posted. After 7 days, if there is no challenge on that uh, withdrawal transaction state route, then the withdrawal transaction is confirmed, then the user uh, will send a L1 withdrawal transaction. The bridge contract will check, have 7 days passed without challenge for that L2 withdrawal, and then they will transfer the bridge contract will transfer the tokens back to the L1 user wallet this is without liquidity provider. So, it takes 7 days to withdraw your assets from optimistic roll ups, but if you have a liquidity provider I have a new entity here LP liquidity provider L1 wallet. So, the liquidity provider will speed up your withdrawals on optimistic roll ups for a fee. So, instead of waiting for 7 days suppose I am in a hurry I want my uh, tokens which are on layer 2 or ether which is on layer 2 I want it on layer 1 immediately. Then you are, you are willing to pay some uh, fees for that uh, speed up then the liquidity provider will reduce the withdrawal times from 7 days to a few minutes. And the way it works is that the user will send their uh, on layer 2 they will not transfer the uh, they will not ask for a withdrawal they will transfer to the liquidity providers L2 address. So, they will transfer tokens on layer 2 to the liquidity providers L layer 2 address. So, you have to trust the layer 2 uh, you have to trust the liquidity provider to not steal your tokens. Then the uh, that block gets uh, included in a state route that is and as long as the, 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 the transaction which posts the layer 2 blocks as call data it has enough confirmations which is a few minutes then the layer uh, the liquidity provider is confident that this uh, uh, the transaction where which was sending tokens which are transferring tokens to its own layer 2 address will eventually get confirmed. So, they will then uh, transfer uh, an amount equal to what was received on layer 2 minus some fees for providing this service to the L1 users wallet. So, this is the liquidity providers L1 wallet. So, the layer 2 uh, the user has transferred funds to the liquidity providers, providers L2 address and then the liquidity pro provider says ok I have received one ether on uh, on my layer 2 and I am confident that it will get confirmed eventually after 7 days. So, let me send 0.95 ether to the user 0 0.05 ether is my fees for providing this service. So, the withdrawal time is reduced from 7 days to just a few minutes. This uh, all the, the steps I showed before all the initiation is that you send your transaction to the roll up operators RPC endpoint. So, the roll up operator can censor transactions is a single entity 
it is not a trustless model because uh, in, uh, uh, in main Ethereum, uh, miners include your transactions into the blocks. So, if one miner is refusing transactions, some other miner will take your transactions. So, there are multiple miners, anybody can take your transactions. In here, in rollups, because the layer 2 uh, is controlled or it is coordinated by the rollup operator, the rollup operator can censor you on layer 2. So, maybe you are trying, sending doing some, trying to do some transfer, but the rollup operator does not like your IP address. Maybe if you are from a country which is sanctioned uh, by the particular government where the rollup operator is operating, so they refuse to take your layer 2 transaction. So, what is the recourse? Because you have transferred your layer 1 assets to layer 2, sometimes you may want to withdraw them. So, if you are and uh, if you, you may want to do some operations on layer 2, but if it is censored, then your layer 2 assets, assets become useless. So, then rollups uh, they always offer a slow path to force include your layer 2 transactions. So, the, so, Arbitrum for example, allows you to include any arbitrary layer 2 transactions in the slow path and uh, ZK Sync allows only asset withdrawals. So, the slow path is actually a layer 1 transaction. So, it costs layer 1 fees. So, people should not, people do not use it unless they are being censored. So, suppose uh, uh, ZK, it is a ZK Sync rollup and the, IMB, uh, the user is being censored. So, they request a asset withdrawal. They are saying that I do not want to use ZK Sync anymore. I want to withdraw my assets back to layer 1. So, the rollup operator has to read these uh, slow path transactions and uh, they will uh, and the operator is forced to include slow path transactions within a deadline. So, the how is it forced? So, the bridge contract has logic which uh, uh, does not accept uh, uh, state routes which uh, do not have slow path transactions. So, slow path transactions are included in the uh, in the bridge contract, they are seen by the bridge contract. So, after a deadline, it will give you a deadline of maybe like within one day, within 24 hours, layer 2 blocks have to include those slow path transactions. If they do not include those slow path transactions, then they will be, they will not be, they will not be allowed, they will be rejected. So, the operator is forced to include slow path transactions within a deadline. And uh, because of that, the uh, even if the uh, rollup operator is censoring transactions on the RPC endpoints, they will have, they will be forced to include that uh, asset withdrawal and eventually that asset withdrawal will get confirmed and the tokens will be transferred back to the user. So, this is one kind of censorship or one, one kind of failure mode, censorship by the operator on layer 2. Uh, but the disadvantage or a con of this is that uh, there is delays and because this uh, you have to wait for longer for your trans withdrawal to happen and also you have to pay two layer 1 transaction fees, one to in, uh, request the asset withdrawal and the other to send the withdrawal transaction itself. The other issue is that you can have an offline operator. So, an operator may just go offline, maybe they are malicious, maybe they just went offline because of some other reason. So, in this case, the bridge contract is not accepting any new blocks. In this case, uh, uh, ZK Sync has something called a full exit, where users can request a full exit of their assets. And uh, once a full exit is requested, then uh, no layer 2 blocks are allowed. After a 14 day uh, uh, time period, uh, you can anyone can activate something called exodus mode and all users can generate a, a ZK or a zero knowledge proof, a validity proof that they own some assets on layer 2 and then they will exit their assets. They will send an exodus transaction and they will get their tokens transferred. So, this is to deal with the offline operators in the sense that if this guy stops working for whatever reason. Then how do you get your assets from layer 2 back to layer 1? And this is for validity rollups. Uh, for optimistic rollups, uh, they also have a uh, mechanism. So, in Arbitrum, they have a, uh, a slow path transaction and that slow path transaction uh, inclusion, it does not require the rollup operator. So, the rollup, uh, the rollup operator goes offline, the slow path transaction is included. After a one day delay, you can force include that slow path transaction in an L2 block, you can create the L2 block on in the bridge contract itself and after 7 days, it will be confirmed because it is an optimistic rollup, it, it requires 7 days. If nobody challenges that uh, layer 2 state route for 7 days, then you can, uh, it gets confirmed and you can withdraw your assets from your bridge contract. So, the effect of minor censorship, so the miners uh, or now with Ethereum 2.0, you have these stakers, they can also censor transactions. So, uh, transactions which are submitted to the bridge contract could be censored by the miners or in this case block producers. 
and also congestion on Ethereum. Suppose there is a lot of uh, congestion on Ethereum layer 1 that can cause censorship on the bridge contract transactions. So, if no new uh, uh, L2 state routes are submitted then the L2 chain will stop progress, there will not be any layer 2 blockchain will stop. In validity rollups, only the liveness of the chain is affected that is no new transactions will be happening, but the funds are secure. But on uh, and censorship by L1 minus is indistinguishable from an offline operator. So, eventually you can get your funds back. Uh, optimistic rollups, if uh, optimistic rollups you require that interactive game to work for uh, for uh, for fault proofs. But if there is censorship on layer 1, if Ethereum transactions cannot be launched to launch the fault proof, then uh, both liveness and security are affected. That suppose the fault proof cannot be executed on layer 1, then uh, a faulty uh, state route can get confirmed. Uh, that is if fault proof transactions are censored for one week, an invalid state route can be confirmed. So, that is a problem with optimistic rollups. Uh, it is unlikely, but it is possible. So, the uh, but if suppose it happens, suppose a faulty state route was confirmed because of some network congestion and some very unlikely scenarios, then what would need to happen is that the operator would need to clone the bridge contract uh, state and restart operation from a correct state. So, here uh, this is a uh, the state uh, the L2 blockchain is a linear list and so let us say one state route which is an incorrect state route got confirmed then you need to start the restart the blockchain from a correct state route. So, you will have to clone the bridge contract all the data is available because all the L2 blocks are available on the Ethereum logs you do not have to uh, depend on the rollup operator. So, you can restart operation from a correct uh, state. So, that is all I had to be fair even though it looks like uh, optimistic rollups security is affected, but here only liveness is affected to be fair at the current state of uh, Ethereum in the current state of Ethereum, optimistic rollups offer much more functionality. They have many more applications on layer 2 than validity rollups. ZK EVMs which are general purpose uh, rollups as of now are being launched and uh, Starknet is a, a, a validity general purpose uh, validity rollup which allows arbitrary contracts, but it requires you to write your contracts in a special language called Cairo. Uh, and uh, because of that there is some friction for users to launch new applications. But the ZK EVMs like Polygon ZK EVM or Scrolls ZK EVM, they allow you to write your contracts in solidity. So, they will be easier uh, from a developer experience point of view. So, people are hoping that uh, they will become live soon and they will see a lot of adoption. So, that is all I had. So, thanks for your attention. Thank you.